All right, we are at our final lecture of the morning. Um, and this is a spotlight lecture on cognitive disorders and Parkinson's disease, which really over the last five to 10 years has gotten a lot of attention in the medical literature. Uh, and I'm really happy uh, that we have Dr. Jennifer Goldman here today, uh, who has a special interest in these and really has made a name for herself uh, in this particular field. Uh, Dr. Oldman is an associate professor uh, in the section of Parkinson's disease and movement disorders in the Department of Neurological Sciences at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And she's also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Illinois. Uh, she, she attended medical school at the Northwestern uh, University and then completed a residency at Washington University in St. Louis before completing a fellowship in movement disorders at Rush in Chicago where, where she's been. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome her here today. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And I realize I'm, I know I'm the person right before lunch. So I hope uh, that uh, you'll stick around. Um, and uh, we're going to continue on the theme talking about non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And in the um, packets, I believe, and handouts up uh, front when you checked in, there are information on my disclosures and grants and research support and so forth. But what we're going to cover uh, in the next uh, session um, is delve into a little bit more on how to recognize the cognitive issues in Parkinson's. And I'll talk a little bit about the definitions that have come about um, trying to categorize different uh, stages, if you will, of cognitive changes in Parkinson's and talk a little bit about the conundrum we still face differentiating Parkinson's disease dementia from dementia with Lewy bodies and some of that controversy. I'll talk a little bit about the spectrum of um, what cognitive issues look like in Parkinson's and some of the risk factors, and then we'll talk about some treatment strategies as well. So um, in really recent years, uh, we really haven't had an evolution of um, what we think about in terms of Parkinson's, and you heard this alluded to in multiple talks this morning and Dr. Merson's guide from 1970 to present, but really Parkinson's is no longer just a motor disease. It's no longer just a dopamine disease. We heard that from Dr. Lewitt. And it's really it behooves us to think of the patient comprehensively and to think of multiple neurotransmitter systems, multiple neuropathologies, and so forth. And so this is um, a review article that was published already five years ago, um, suggesting that Parkinson's disease is actually the quintessential neuropsychiatric disorder, kind of turning everything we have thought and learned over many, many years about the cardinal motor features upside down. And we heard um, from Dr. Spiritu about depression and anxiety, and this just highlights several of the non-motor mainly neuropsychiatric features that we focus on in Parkinson's. Today I'm only going to talk about cognition, and of course many of these could be uh, other topics of interest. And this just shows um, the Movement Disorder Society Journal started its first publication in 1986, which is why the graph begins there, but just the sheer explosion of studies and research uh, publications highlighting the neuropsychiatric disorders. So cognitive issues really greatly impact patients with Parkinson's disease, as well as their caregivers and families. We know that they are highly common, and from several studies, this one highlighted here, the Sydney uh, study that's now followed patients for over 20 years, suggests that in their follow-up phases that cognitive decline occurs in many patients, so 84%, and dementia about half. So these are pretty staggering numbers, um, and it really uh, suggests that we need to do a lot more to understand cognitive decline and to prevent and better treat it. It is also difficult to treat, so cognitive symptoms generally are those that don't respond to levodopa the way many of the motor features of tremor and gait do. And over time, they are some of the predominant features. So when patients are followed 10, 15, 20 years out, although they may have dyskinesias and falls and many other really important motor symptoms, the neuropsychiatric and cognitive ones are high up on the list. 
Many studies indicate that these are associated with poor outcomes, and some of these are just listed here, but increased morbidity, nursing home placement, certainly for dementia or psychosis, increased fall risk, as well as mortality. There's a broad spectrum of Parkinson's cognitive impairment, and so now that we've started to recognize that cognitive impairment is indeed a feature of Parkinson's disease, we're actually realizing it's even much more complicated than that. So when you look at cognitive impairment in Parkinson's, we can think about it in a couple different ways. One of which is how, how severe is it? And that might range from just really mild bradyphrenia. So that's like the, the mental equivalent of bradykinesia, so slowed finger taps or heel taps. This is slowness in thought, slowness in process. And bradyphrenia is not a new concept. This term has been around for many, many decades. Over more recent years, um, we've realized a stage that I'll talk a little bit more about called mild cognitive impairment that may be a prodrome to developing dementia or a stage unto itself. And then, of course, we've recognized for many years even that dementia can occur in Parkinson's, but it really hasn't come to the forefront the way it has today. So these deficits can range from very mild to more severe. We also know that there are different subtypes or categorizations of what the phenotype looks like for Parkinson's cognitive impairment. There are multiple cognitive domains that can be affected. Some patients may have more memory deficits, some may have more executive function deficits, others may have more visual spatial trouble. Some patients can be just affected in one domain, which we consider single domain impairment, or multitudes of domains, such as executive plus memory and so forth. And then there are other features that we might consider in terms of subtypes that uh, we're starting to learn about in terms of risk factors or even genetics underlying Parkinson's cognitive impairment. So what are some of the cognitive features that we see in these patients? We heard a few of them this morning um, in Dr. Merson's talk, but we've now uh, come to realize that mild cognitive complaints in the clinic are really quite common. I mean, if you ask, you will find out. Um, patients frequently report that they're slower in their thinking. One of the hallmarks of uh, 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 cognitive features have been what we call executive dysfunction, which you all may be very familiar with on some levels. And this includes trouble with planning, trouble with organization, solving problems, trying to multitask, or even dual task, as we'll hear about, um, you know, trying to talk and walk at the same time. Patients can have difficulty shifting between tasks, so they'll start something and it kind of gets stuck on it, and it's hard to get them onto the next topic or next activity. It also might be hard to get them to start an activity, too, um, which shows the interplay between cognition and apathy, mood and motivation as well. Patients may have decreased attention or concentration, paying attention to a conversation, reading a book, and so forth. I think one of the, the uh, other take-home points is that you know when people talk about cognition and when we ask patients, one of the most frequent answer we get frequent answers we get is, "Oh, my memory's bad." Well, and there's so much more to cognition than just memory. So one needs to you know delve a little bit deeper into this. So problems can, that can occur with short-term memory can be related to either the learning of the information or the retrieval of the information. And there may be some differences between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's on this, but some of these can be problems, uh, both of these can be problems in Parkinson's. We know that for Parkinson's patients, they generally um, improve with recall um, when given cues. So they perform better on recognition tasks than recall on neuropsychological tests or if they're given cues or choices um, to choose among, um, they do better on remembering items. And that's kind of a good um, tactic you know, when working with patients, because the information's there, it might take longer for them to access it, and it might be more readily available if they're given choices rather than really open-ended questions. Long-term memory is generally okay, although in severe dementias we may see impairment in that. Patients can have visual spatial dysfunction, which can range from uh, impaired sense of direction, trouble navigating in their environment, you know, leaving your exam room and turning the wrong way to go down the hall or so forth. And one of the common uh, 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 cognitive um, 
features that we see in that patients and their caregivers will report is that they have trouble finding the words they want to say. So trouble articulating, getting out the right words that um, would express their thoughts. And we heard a bit about how important that is for communication uh, between uh, patients and their family members, uh, patients and their doctors, and really much of society. So how do we diagnose cognitive deficits in Parkinson's? Well, there are a number of different ways. So certainly patient report. It's important to understand for the person, does this represent a decline in their abilities? Is this something new? Um, some patients will tell me, oh, I've always been bad at visual spatial skills. Like, it's never been my strong suit. And well, maybe that's still impaired, but maybe it's worse. Um, so getting the patient's input. And again, some of this may play into anxiety and depression where there are um, patients who might say their cognition is impaired, but then you test them and they actually do quite well. So because cognitive uh, abilities can be somewhat subjective, it's helpful to have an informant's report. And that could be the caregiver, friend, um, uh, spouse, or so forth, to corroborate the information. As clinicians, we're always observing their behaviors and what they say. And then really objective evidence um, can be very helpful. And this can take the form of simple bedside tests, like the mini mental state exam, uh, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Battery, even simple things like drawing a clock um, or doing serial sevens at the bedside. And then more formal neuropsychological testing, which can tap into uh, global cognitive domains as well as tests for memory, executive function, processing speed, and so forth. Um, and then well, there are new diagnostic criteria that talk about how to define Parkinson's dementia mild cognitive impairment, and other conditions that can be used for clinical or research basis. So as I mentioned before, we've realized that actually defining cognitive impairment in Parkinson's has gotten even more complicated than uh, we, we probably imagined. And these are, this is a grab bag of terms that have floated around um, and trying to differentiate, well, how's Parkinson's Cognitive change is different from Alzheimer's, the t umbrella term of Lewy body dementia, different phenotypes, and so forth. And I just want to tackle a little bit of this with some definitions uh, that have been put forth really over um, the past several years to emphasize the uniqueness of cognitive changes in Parkinson's. So in the past, this is the, the past to the present, like some of the other, other talks, um, so in the past, people defined Parkinson's dementia really based on, at that point, dsm 4 or even previous editions of a dementia due to other medical conditions, highly emphasizing that deficits were memory as well as other domains and significant enough to affect activities of daily living and representing a decline in function. Studies that you read may have used um, mini mental cutoff scores or the clinical dementia rating scale, which is an Alzheimer's scale. Um, as well as using what we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, the one-year rule to differentiate Parkinson's disease dementia from dementia with Lewy bodies, which uh, stipulates that Parkinsonism, the motor features, precede the onset of dementia by at least a year. So back in, uh, actually, the mid-2000s, this article was published in 2007, the Movement Disorder Society started to have some task forces to help define uh, Parkinson's disease dementia in the context of Parkinson's, really setting it apart from Alzheimer's disease. And while there might be Alzheimer pathology, you know, explaining some of the Parkinson's symptoms, really having a unique set of criteria could help us on the clinical and research front. And so I just want to call your attention to, to two main features that, that um, are different when we think about this in Parkinson's. So one is that um, it does not require that memory is impaired. So we recognize in patients with Parkinson's, they could be significantly impaired in executive function or visual spatial function, but not so much memory, and yet still be demented. It also emphasizes that their prominent behavioral symptoms and associated clinical features, including apathy, mood, psychosis, and sleepiness. And it provides some element for research uh, criteria based on um, degree of comprehensiveness of the assessment, this being kind of a simple bedside assessment, this being a full neuropsychological evaluation. 
So one of the questions that always comes up is how, how is Parkinson's dementia different from other dementia syndromes? And this is just a table that highlights several basic features and in this um, uh, separates out Parkinson's disease dementia from dementia with Lewy bodies. As you can see here, um, uh, you know, there's some thought that Parkinson's disease dementia occurs many years after motor features, usually later in this course, whereas obviously memory and dementia is a prominent and early feature of Alzheimer's and an earlier feature of dementia with Lewy bodies, as its name suggests. Prominent cognitive symptoms may differ a little bit um, with Alzheimer's disease having a greater preponderance of memory and language deficits. Parkinsonism, obviously, yes, in Parkinson's disease, and maybe in dementia with Lewy bodies. Some patients do not have greater um, degree of Parkinsonian symptoms. Hallucinations can be common in Parkinson's disease dementia and are much more common in dementia with Lewy bodies. And also these patients can fluctuate. So some days they're very lucid, some days they're very confused. And there may be a great clinical overlap between PDD and DLB, which I'll talk about in a moment. So at the current time frame, um, there are separate uh, research uh, definitions and criteria for dementia with Lewy bodies um, that are listed here. This last uh, report was revised in 2005, and there was a recent meeting uh, on the DLB um, consortiums to talk about this and where do these fall under a Lewy body uh, disease spectrum. And here you can see really the main, main difference is in the temporal sequence. There may be clinical features that overlap, but as I mentioned before, it's which comes first, more cognitive or more motor. And so really the definition includes that one has to have dementia um, and the other two, uh, two or more features, or one, of the, one or two of these three features, uh, fluctuating cognition, recurrent visual hallucinations, or features of Parkinsonism, and a whole host of suggestive features, including REM sleep behavior disorder, autonomic dysfunction, and neuroleptic sensitivity. And really, this will come into play as we're trying to define prodromal cohorts that might evolve into synucleinopathies um, based on REM behavior disorder and mild cognitive impairment. So really, you know, the umbrella term is Lewy body disorders, which encompasses both PD dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, really depending on which is the most prominent phenotype and perhaps where the Lewy bodies are deposited, whether they're greater in the higher cortical regions or in the Brock staging um, uh, in uh, brainstem and then later into uh, limbic and cortical regions. So it suggests that if you're a lumper or a splitter, if you're a lumper, you're considering them the same. If you're a splitter, you're considering them two different entities and kind of really two sides of the same coin. So this has led us to think about earlier stages of Parkinson's cognitive impairment, um, regardless of really where the, the Lewy body dementia end is. So looking back, um, taking lessons from Alzheimer's disease to look for stages called mild cognitive impairment and prodromal stages um, that might help us devise treatments to slow down the cognitive decline process. And this has led to um, a group that I, uh, through the Movement Disorder Task Force, has been um, defining what MCI might look like. Again, the past many studies in the earlier phases of this used traditional MCI and Alzheimer uh, criteria using um, whether it was memory or not. Um, there were deficits present, but they did not significantly impact activities of daily living, and they were mild. In, Alzheimer's, uh, in the Alzheimer's world, about 5 to 10 percent of amnestic MCI patients uh, per year go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. And so, you know, taking lessons from that, we wanted to look at how could we define that in Parkinson's. So that led to this group. Um, but really, you know, because Parkinson's is so different in many respects, it's important to have a unique definition in Parkinson's. And so again, this highlights that there are milder deficits representing gradual decline from premorbid function um, and not meeting yet criteria for dementia um, because activities of living are generally intact um, 
and this has led to several clinical studies as well as several research trials that have implemented uh, definitions with these criteria. With this, um, it's helped us to actually realize that cognitive deficits are present even in newly diagnosed Parkinson's disease. So many years ago, people thought, oh, this cognitive changes, those are just late stage phenomenon. We don't need to worry about those. Let's treat the motor and we can you know, deal with that if, if and when it pops up. However, these are four examples, um, uh, international examples, showing that newly diagnosed patients, so disease durations less than two years and untreated with dopaminergic therapies, using a variety of definitions, um, including the task force criteria, that between 20 to even 40 percent of these patients may have mild cognitive deficits. And this is shown you know, across multiple countries. In a large international consortium, this uh, includes eight sites with almost 1,300, just over 1,300 patients. Um, they looked at the frequency of PDMCI, uh, combining several uh, cohorts of longer standing disease and several newly diagnosed uh, uh, patients. And they found that about 25% of them would meet criteria for PDMCI. So again, changing the way we're thinking about Parkinson's disease. In this group, um, large group, the Parkinson's patients with uh, MCI were significantly older, had longer disease duration, worse motor function um, and depression, and particularly in this cohort, we're using more dopamine agonists compared to those without. And as you can see, a variety of cognitive domains were affected. So I mentioned the Sydney study before, which is highlighted here on the bottom, as well as um, a study, earlier study from Norway that really suggests that the progression to dementia and Parkinson's is frequent. Um, with, uh, you know, if you look at eight years and beyond, about 80% of the patients in these groups uh, exhibiting signs of dementia. And that's led us to look, you know, does, if someone's diagnosed with PDMCI, do they progress to dementia? Is this a prodromal phase? Should we be intervening here? And, and, what, and with what and why and, and how? And so these are two examples of studies, one from um, uh, the Netherlands and the other one from Norway, that looked at early stage Parkinson's patients. And here you could see at um, baseline in the study on the left, uh, about 35% of their patients had PDMCI. At thir three years later, 50, 50 plus percent of them had MCI as well. And same with the other group, with a progression to uh, um, greater degrees of cognitive impairment. So this is something that we need to understand. How does this progress? Do all patients progress? And if so, at what rate? And this has led um, people to speculate that actually not all patients with PDMCI progress to dementia. So we know that many do, but there are patients and cohorts that demonstrate that one could have mild deficits, and that's all one might ever have. And so this is a study um, from the United Kingdom called Campaign, uh, and they've been following um, newly diagnosed patients uh, with Parkinson's for up to 10 years now. And what they've put forth is that there might be two different uh, phenotypes and actually two different genotypes underlying who might progress from uh, normal cognition to dementia. And this highlights that their patients, they've found that have greater attention, working memory, and executive function deficits who sort of remain stable. So they may have mild deficits um, and perhaps a greater degree of dopaminergic dysfunction, but at 10 years, they're, they're still having mild deficits and not dementia. Whereas other patients with this posterior cortical phenotype, which really means that they have greater language impairment poor semantic fluency, worse visual spatial skills and memory, go on and more rapidly to develop a dementing syndrome. There may be genetic differences that underlie this and even perhaps other neuropathologies. So these patients may have some genetic um, uh, polymorphisms in the CMT uh, uh, gene which regulates metabolism or uh, catabolism of dopamine and uh, those who have a greater risk to go on to dementia, have um, polymorphisms in uh, the MAPT, which uh, regulates tau uh, microtubule function, as well as ApoE, perhaps. 
So this leads us to try to decipher what might be potential risk factors for cognitive decline. And probably the top three listed here are those that are best worked out or presented in the literature, and that's older age, greater motor severity, and having baseline cognitive impairment. The other ones suggest that having uh, longer Parkinson's duration, perhaps an akinetic rigid motor phenotype, other non-motor um, neuropsychiatric symptoms may contribute to a higher risk of cognitive decline, as well as this neuropsychological profile, and perhaps other um, genetic uh, factors at play. So for Parkinson's dementia and cognitive impairment, why does it occur? Well, there can be a number of different reasons, and several of these could occur simultaneously. They could happen individually as well. But we know from uh, pathology studies that Lewy bodies can form in brain regions that are involved in cognition, whether it's the mesial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, uh, prefrontal, and other cortical regions. We know there can be changes in the neurotransmitters. Um, we heard a little bit about that this morning. We know that patients can have coexisting Alzheimer's disease changes. Uh, they can have amyloid and tau aggregates in various regions of the brain. And other uh, coexisting changes affecting the vascular system, so latent um, cerebrovascular disease. This just highlights um, the, the role of many of the neurotransmitter systems and the brain pathways. And we know these are involved in cognition, frontostriatal and in executive function and working memory. We know the temporal lobe system, frontal lobe system uh, is highly cholinergic and is involved in attention, learning, memory, as well as gait. Um, we heard a bit about norepinephrine uh, this morning from Dr. Lewitt and its role in uh, attention, um, as well as working memory and alertness and vigilance, as well as serotonin. Um, and so all these have come into play and actually form some of the basis of the drugs that we might use to treat cognitive symptoms. We're learning about the neuropathology of both Parkinson's dementia and PDMCI, and there's really a lot more to learn about this, but we have seen that um, there's Lewy body deposition uh, in various regions um, throughout uh, the brainstem, uh, limbic and cortical regions. This uh, diagram shows that, that's uh, an earlier study um, uh, from Brock's group showing increased uh, Lewy body pathology uh, associated with lower mini mental scores, so the greater the dementia, um, the greater the Lewy body pathology, as well as that there may be influences from Alzheimer-like pathologies as well. This is uh, one of uh, two few studies um, looking at pathology of PDMCI, and again suggesting that this might be heterogeneous, um, not only in clinical deficits with some patients having amnestic MCI, but some having um, non-amnestic MCI with a variety of pathologies, including Lewy bodies, um, some Alzheimer-like uh, pathologies, as well as some vascular changes. So it may be that multiple etiologies contribute to cognitive changes. One thing we're, we're trying to do in some of our lab uh, works on imaging biomarkers, um, as well as other groups, including the Michigan uh, group, who's done a lot of work on cholinergic uh, denervation uh, in pet studies, is to identify, can we, can we see into the brain? Is there a window to look for these biomarkers? And here is just a, a, a potpourri of imaging studies showing that there are atro there's atrophy in widespread gray matter regions in patients with dementia and Parkinson's, and perhaps to a lesser degree in PDMCI. There may be metabolic um, changes uh, with decreased uh, glucose and meta metabolism in prefrontal and frontal areas and parietal areas associated with a PD cognitive profile. There may be cholinergic de denervation as well as in some, some degree of amyloid deposition, although it might not meet the same degree as in Alzheimer's disease. We're also looking at, are there uh, spinal fluid markers? Many of these are drawn from the Alzheimer field and show that, that some of the levels of amyloid correlate with a variety of different clinical patterns of cognitive changes in terms of pattern recognition and Montreal Cognitive Assessment scores, and that some of those patients who have a greater decrease in amyloid may have a more rapid cognitive decline on some of the neuropsychological batteries.
So these might be markers or these might help us identify patients with specific types of cognitive deficits and perhaps even specific targeted therapies. So I'm going to turn to talk a little bit about the management of cognitive problems, particularly as uh, many of you may be clinicians in the audience um, and want some uh, information on uh, um, how we treat these or manage these patients. So I think first and foremost, um, if someone's coming in with acute cognitive changes, it's really important to exclude other causes. Most of the cognitive changes we see are gradual. So usually if someone's having something that just happened overnight or happened over a few days, it's really important to uh, exclude an infection like a UTI, to look at their medication list, you know, where they just put on a different dose of medicine or a pain medicine or a bladder medicine um, or anticholinergic, all of which can cause confusion or cognitive changes. So very important to review those medicine lists for not only the Parkinson's drugs, but non-Parkinson drugs. And then to consider, do we want to prescribe medicines for cognition, consider non-pharmacologic interventions, and of course, uh, really evaluating the home for safety uh, and driving abilities, as well as uh, their um, abilities at work. So right now, the treatment for Parkinson's dementia, um, I guess the slide could be very short because there's only one medicine that's, that's FDA approved in the United States, and that's rivastigmine, otherwise known as Exelon, based on a large pivotal trial called the EXPRESS study that was published back in 20, uh, 2004, so that's well over a decade ago. And that's a cholinesterase inhibitor um, that comes in both an oral form and a patch form. And it uh, keeps company with other uh, cholinesterase inhibitors listed here that are approved in Alzheimer's. Um, several higher doses are also approved in Alzheimer's, but we don't have clinical studies of them in Parkinson's disease as of yet. There's also the um, NMDA antagonist um, memantine or Nemenda, which has been looked at in a couple trials of Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies with sort of mixed um, uh, results among the different trials. There's several medicines under investigation. So this is really exciting. I think for the first time in this field, we're, we're seeing traction and interest in developing strategies to treat cognitive symptoms and hopefully at some point cognitive decline. So currently there's a study uh, ongoing um, called the Synapse Trial. It's a, a BioTie and Michael J. Fox uh, funded study and it's looking at serotonergic compounds. So it's a 5-HT6 uh, and 5-HDTOA um, uh, antagonist and this really brings into play actually the role of the serotonergic system in kind of an exciting pharmacologic area. So that's underway in recruiting patients. Many of you may have heard in the media about um, nilotinib, which is a leukemia drug that got a big media blast um, this past fall for some very pilot work that was done. I'm looking at about 10, 12 patients. Um, and that was a pilot study that was completed um, uh, in PDD and DLB patients. Um, there may be more to hear about that, but very, very preliminary at this stage. There's some other studies looking at um, uh, other serotonergic compounds, particularly for uh, diagnosed dementia with Lewy body patients, um, one called RVT-101, one called nilotanserin for REM behavior disorder, and there are several studies looking at um, DBS for uh, an area involved in um, memory circuitry, uh, the nucleus basalis of Maynard, um, in PDD and DLB. And these are really pilot studies, so I think there's a lot to learn. But uh, the exciting point is we're actually seeing some of this in action. Um, and then lifestyle modifications, which I'll touch on in a moment. We've also started to see trials in um, PDMCI, and I put it in quotes only because it's been really variably defined among the different trials. But this is, again, looking at earlier stages or, or of cognitive changes. There have been several looking at different cholinesterase inhibitors, denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. Um, the denepazil one was an open-label small study, and the other twos were double-blind placebo-controlled studies and um, failed to show a significant change between the drug and placebo. And I think the other point is that we're learning a lot about what kind of outcome measures do we need, what kind of scales do we need to assess cognition, what kind of patients do we need to enroll in these trials. <clears throat> 
Kind of continuing on the noradrenergic theme, um, there have been several studies on uh, adamoxetine and uh, Parkinson's executive function. This is an open label study that suggested some improvement. And then there was a larger placebo controlled study that was really done for depression, not for cognition, but they saw an improvement in some mini mental scores. And that led to a trial that was recently completed with um, uh, PDMCI patients, and those results are not yet available. There have been some studies looking at risagiline, which is an MAOB inhibitor used to treat motor symptoms of Parkinson's, um, with one earlier study showing improvement in attention and some elements of working memory and verbal fluency that then led to a larger study that was recently completed and published, I think maybe about two weeks ago, and unfortunately did not show a significant change on the outcome measure, the cognitive measure here. So it did show improvement on the motor features, but not on the cognitive outcome measure. So more to come, hopefully. So one of the things that patients always bring in and ask about are, you know, non-pharmacologic strategies. How do I keep my brain healthy? What sort of activities should I do? And there's really a growing field of neurobics um, and brain games and uh, many industries uh, looking into this. Um, I think one of the take-homes for that is we need really robust, well-designed trials, which are hard to do with many of these non-pharmacological measures. But we are starting to see emerging literature and evidence of exercise improving cognition. This is just one example, looking at resistance training and some cognitive measures. And there have been several nice review articles looking at cognitive training. So to bring things from brain games to puzzles to computers, um, I, I, um, games and tasks. Uh, and one of the questions is, you know, does this, um, what do we use as a placebo for these uh, types of trials? And if someone makes gains on these, does it transfer into other skills? Or do they just get better at attention or, you know, whatever um, target they're trying to, you know, get at at that computer game? So a lot to learn on that. But I think we're seeing much, much more of this. So hopefully we'll have some evidence to share with patients over time. Just want to close with a few practical tips um, that are handy in the clinic and working with um, patients and their families. So one is that it's um, important to uh, do things one in seriatim, so one thing at a time. So I show rather than to tell them, because it's sometimes hard to remember instructions, and not to show and tell at the same time. So don't try to multitask. I always tell patients, when you're walking, you're walking, and when you're talking, you have a conversation. Keeping language simple, giving patients choices rather than open-ended questions can be helpful. It's always um, useful to have another pair of eyes and ears at the appointment, so having caregivers come with them. Uh, writing things down, even if someone's retired, keeping track of the date and just keeping their general orientation skills can be very good. It's important to have a regular routine, so even if it sounds really boring, it helps patients if they go to bed at the same time at night, get up the same time in the morning, have a regular exercise routine. It just really helps their whole circadian pattern and probably their cognition as well. There's a lot of work being done in Parkinson's and outside of Parkinson's on the role of social, socialization and having a good community and support system and how that can help with cognitive uh, changes. And then of course addressing um, psychosocial needs, whether it's driving, safety, or long-term planning and so forth. And of course there are many resources available for patients and caregivers. And so with that, I'll just close in summary um, that I hope you now recognize that these issues are common and they really are now recognized across all stages of Parkinson's. So not just a late stage phenomenon, but there can be changes early on and they warrant discussion and screening with patients and the caregivers in the clinic. So with that, I'll close. Thank you.
Great. Um, so the, the question in a, in a nutshell is how do we get more conversation um, about cognitive changes from patients, from doctors out in the community, primary care? And, you know, this is where it really takes a village, I think. Um, it takes, you know, coming to a symposium like this to be able to spread the word to ask about it. Um, you know, I think once, and to break down some of the barriers that it's okay to talk about these things. Yes, they're really scary and, you know, fearful about talking about cognition, talking about psychosis. These are, these are the, you know, the elephants in the, in the room. But recognizing that um, there are things that we can do that can be helpful in managing them. It might not make some of the symptoms go away, but we can take better care of patients and help prevent, you know, um, uh, major uh, uh, challenges with it. So, you know, I think education is part of it. I think advocacy, I think um, recognition, and, and really, you know, asking and, and recognizing that the non-motor features are part and parcel to some degree of Parkinson's. Um, and there's a little shift in the mindset. So, thank you. Peter. Right. In the next few days, we're gonna probably have a new medication on the market for treating so-called Parkinson's disease psychosis. And my question is your impression of if one aggressively treats this with whatever medications we have, do you think treating the psychosis, the hallucinations, and so on is going to have any effect for the better or for the worse on cognitive function in Parkinson's? Nitrous oxide. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we'll we'll come back we'll come back to that one in a in a in a moment. Uh, so let me let me address um, the the new potential new um, medication on the horizon and then some other comments in in general in medicines. Um, what Dr. Lewitt was referring to is um, there's a medication under in investigation um, uh, called pimavanserin, which is also a serotonergic compound. It's a 5-HD2A inverse agonist um, that has been studied to treat psychosis, so hallucinations and delusions, which, um, you know, of course, are very common as well and kind of co-bedfellows of, of cognitive impairment. Um, and that's under FDA review right now uh, based on a large trial um, published in uh, 2014. And so one of the questions is, if, if one is able to treat, treat psychosis um, and perhaps lessen confusion or a mind that is you know, paying attention to things that are not really there, could that secondarily increase um, cognitive abilities or cognitive function? And I think that's something that remains to be seen. Um, you know, I think we, when patients are more lucid, you know, not preoccupied by seeing something that's in the environment that's not really there or reaching at something. I, I would presume that there's a high likelihood they might be a little clearer in their thought process. We see this too with sleep. Um, I mean, I think we all know we feel better on a good night's sleep um, that, uh, you know, it helps with the thought process and just greater clarity. And perhaps there may be a role of looking at other secondary um, uh, medications and effects uh, among the non-motor symptoms. 